Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week we interview film professionals to discuss their work. And this week I'm joined by the VFX team behind Apple Plus Plus's foundation, Chris McLean and Addy Manis. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. I guess my my first question is when you got on to foundation, because this is based on Isaac Asimov's work, how much was in the book that you guys could sort of use to jump off of uh, for creating this and how much did you sort of have to come up with? Um, Addie, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the way that the show kind of got kicked off, uh, it was, you know, um, Michael Malone called me, uh, the producer of the show. And, and, you know, I, I hadn't actually read the books before. Mm-hmm. Um, but he called me, he said he had this project with David Boyer called foundation. Um, he'd like me to come out to LA for an interview. So I went out, um, I read the book on the way, um, on the, on the plane ride. Um, you know, and it read, you know, very, it was like, like, like a political thriller or political drama, uh, and, and I thought we were going to be doing something like West Wing in space or something like that. Um, then I got to Skydance to the interview. We, uh, you know, they, they put me in front of David Goyer. They sent me the script and then I read the script and the script itself was, you know, it was, uh, probably the first, uh, I want to say like the first page of the first book or something. It was like, the whole series is about the first third of the first book, but it, it was, it was a much more character driven story. So uh, to, to answer that, I think David took, um, you know, took that encyclopedic view or that 5,000 foot view that Asimov used to write the books and then was asked the question, what was going on with the characters inside of, inside of those, you know, uh, one line quips that he would write, mm-hmm. like, and then, and then the foundation became a religion and things like that. You know, like it was a lot, it, uh, I think, I think in order to make a visual version of this, he kind of, he had to uh, expand upon what Asimov had written and, and ask those questions about what those characters were doing inside of all of those, you know, small paragraphs. So, hmm. um, so I hope that answers the question, but it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a hard question to answer without giving a little bit of context about how, how it all started. So, yeah um no it's it's interesting because i'm always wondering like how much description in the book do you take and then sort of convert into the graphics or work with your team to create that uh, look um in terms of the look um i mean we really uh you know there was there were descriptions of things we took from the Mm -hmm. from the books like uh there were uh tether resource ships that would come to transport and, and deliver resources for the planet because it had stripped itself completely of uh, of all of its resources so the empire relies on other planets to supply transor yeah um you know you could say it's even an allegory for los angeles or something like that you know where you know there's no water there and it all kind of gets brought into this desert so um or they how they built the aqueducts in the 50s and things like that but um it, it's uh, that that was one example. Plus, we had all of the uh, all of the uh, you know art that other people had done, which which played heavily into how Rory designed a lot of it. Like uh, John Berkey and Chris Foss and those guys, you know, they they had uh, done some great cover art that we wanted to kind of incorporate into into the the look of the show, and we we took that mm-hmm. and ran with it. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, finding vendors and, and doing, you know, partnering with them to make sure that we had the right people on uh, that could take that vision forward and things like that. So, 
we definitely leaned into the scripts uh, more than the books in terms of the visual language. Although Chris raised a really interesting point about drawing from the 20th century sci-fi cover art. And there's this like huge wealth of decades of art um, that may not be in Asimov's text, but is still sort of part of the canon of literature that surrounds him. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, one thing about the Asimov books and all of his books is that they, he is very philosophical and he was very dialed into the current science at the time and making projections about where the current science might lead. And so I think his, um, that sort of drove tone a little bit about wanting to live in a real space. It's not, um, it's not a fantastical space. It's not a comic book space. It's not a cartoon colored space. Um, Asimov's genre of sci-fi is based in reality. It's based in philosophy. It's based in politics. And I think um, Chris and David and everybody involved kind of like took that nugget of realism and like ran it forward. Interesting. Now, what would you say, you know, like, I'm not sure what the VFX budget was for um, Apple TV's foundation, but every team I've ever talked about with, you know, you always want as much money as you can get <laughs> to make it like perfect, but you always have those constraints where did you have um, a, like a particular budgetary restraint and did it, how did you guys work within that? to to get this because it looks like a million you know well i guess a million dollars nowadays <laughs> on a feature film or tv show doesn't go far it looks like a billion bucks i'd say so how did you guys work within the constraints of your budget um addy did a lot of really hard work on that um we we <laughs> uh what were we we were uh one half or less mm -hmm. than a half of some of the bigger shows that were out at the same time with less episodes. Um, I won't say exactly how much it was, but um, we were, we were playing with, uh, with very little money. Um, so uh, the, the process was, as we would try to minimize visual effects during the shoot, which meant building practically and shooting practically. Um, then when that didn't work, um, Addie would go to the vendors and, and do her magic. And then, uh, if that didn't work or we ran into problems, we, you know, would just, we would have to ask for more money. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the, the kind of sim simplistic way of putting it. Addie, do you want to talk, speak to that yeah, a little I bit mean, more? Cause that's, that's your realm completely. Um, yeah, I mean, every project wishes they had more money because you there's no such thing as unlimited money. So whatever yeah. your limit is, people are always thinking of bigger ideas. It's just like the nature of human creativity. So that it's just always gonna happen. Um, uh, Chris and the team in Europe shot on a huge amount of locations, went to stunningly beautiful remote locations, found locations that in a lot of other scenarios, um, the show might've been shooting on full blue stage and we mm -hmm. shot actually very little flute uh, full blue stage the set builds were huge practical locations were amazing um and so you know you manage a visual effects budget down by making everything that can be practical practical and I think it it lends a lot of weight and a lot of beauty to the show that you I mean it feels different I think even to an audience that isn't that fluent in visual effects I think it feels different if you're standing on a location than if you're standing on a stage the lighting's different it's different for the actors it's it's great um, and that did work almost entirely all of the time. It's, uh, but a project like Foundation has, you know, entire scenes, you'll read scripts and you'll say, okay, well, there's an eight minute full CG sequence. So we're like, definitely not going to go to space and like blow up a planet. So there is no like practical, you know, you get elements where you can, but that's going to be visual effects. So um, I would say the simple answer to how did we manage the budget is planning that we find all of our moments that have to have the biggest, heaviest visual effects. And then Chris worked incredibly hard with art department to make as much practical as humanly possible. And maybe visual effects sweetens it here or there. We work hand in hand with production design, but um, it's like let the production de designer carry as much of the show as possible because there is plenty of visual effects. There's so much work to go around. We don't need to be mm -hmm. about grabbing it. Um, and otherwise, you shoot as well as you can. And um, 
then once we get into editorial, everybody tries to be very efficient. And if you can tell the story in three shots, then tell it in three, don't tell it in 12. It, you know, it gives the show sort of an elegant, efficient narrative tone, but um, like, let's just not be excessive. Let's have five shots that are stunningly beautiful instead of 25 shots that are just like fast and jittery and sloppy. Um, it, and it's a function of making decisions. Um, the editors, the showrunner, David Goyer, Chris, everybody make decisions. We stick to our decisions. We cut it as tight and as well as we can. And then we try not to change the edit. Um, it's, it is a big deal in visual effects to change a cut at the last minute. Um, you end up throwing away a ton of work, which is a ton of money. And then you dump a ton of money and a ton of human beings on stuff to get it done really fast. And it never looks as good. Um, Chris is laughing. I'm sure he can speak to that at length, but it's planning, trying to get as much practical as you can. And then being like very clear in your decision-making skills. And all of that goes to both quality and money at the same time. Now you mentioned that Chris was laughing. <laughs> is there a particular scene that you loved that, all of a sudden got scrapped <laughs> that you were uh, thinking of? No, no, it's just, um, it, it's something that like, uh, we, we do like the, the problem now with visual effects is, is on a show like this, uh, which is kind of, kind of unique is, is we had a lot of, uh, creative power near the end or creative clout at the end of the show and, and at the end of the process. So, um, you know, we would get into edits and, and, you know, some of the directors are really cutty. They like to do like, you know, uh, uh, like for instance, they'll, they'll do a, a scene where we have to do a background extension or, or a set extension. And they might cut back to that angle 20 times in their, in their original cut. And then, you know, we'll go in with where we would go in with David Goyer and, and the editor and, and go, okay, can we do this in like five cuts? and find a different way to block the scene uh, after what's been shot has been shot and it's been edited and things like that. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's necessary to, to think like that on a show like this, when you want to do uh, big tentpole sequences, like, uh, like the star bridge collapse at the beginning of uh, the pilot or, in, or at the end of the pilot. Um, uh, where you've got to save all that money and, and, and allocate all of your, all of your resources to that scene or to that sequence. Uh, because if you have another scene, which maybe we weren't planning to do a bunch of visual effects in, but uh, a director and a, a director of photography maybe didn't, uh, didn't notice that they were shooting off the set for 90% of the coverage, that then that becomes a half a million dollar sequence. You don't want to, you don't want to have that happen. And, and, um, and if it does happen, you have to try to mitigate it in the edit. And that's, that's what I was kind of laughing about was that that was, that, that's a lot of what, what we do and a lot of the painstaking process that we went through on season one. So, um, and, and it luckily David Goyer was amicable to that because a lot of the times um, people don't understand like David understands the visual effects process uh, quite a bit more than other showrunners or other uh, writers um, just because he's been around for so long and he's really engaged with the uh, filmmaking process. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of showrunners, they may just be writers or they may have not been on set or, you know, some of them don't even go to, uh, to location or go to the stages um, yeah. and they do everything in post. So, um, uh, there's, but David was very engaged with us all the way through the process. So we, we kind of, and he trusted us to do that and, and to, you know, help make those changes and make those suggestions and, and keep things, uh, you know, keep, keep our resources for where it mattered most. So. Was there a particular scene this season, uh, that was challenging for you, uh, both of you that you're really happy with the outcome, uh, really proud with it, but you know, what was, what were some of the challenges of that? I can think of one in particular, Addy, you tell me if, if this, uh, <laughs> if this is right or wrong, but uh, the, the, the uh, hanging sequence in 102, um, where, where Day goes into the, the scar on Trantor and hangs the delegates. Yeah. Um, I think that was, a, that was a great example of, uh, you know, of Addy rallying the troops 
finding a vendor that could come on. This was uh, this was after uh, COVID had happened. Um, one of our main vendors, uh, you know, the with with everything that went on with the visual effects industry, you know, we lost a lot of uh, of talent to um, you know you know to furloughs, layoffs, people quitting, things like that. So. Uh, the way we had broken the show up when we went into COVID and the way that we had to pick it up at the end were very different. So um, at the end, Addie had to, had, had to do a lot of work to get other vendors on. And uh, she brought on rodeo effects um, to help us with that. And, and it was, uh, it, it was one of the, I think it was one of the first things we shot after we went back. I can't remember, mm. but, um, but it was, uh, it was a very, uh, very quick, uh, uh, turnaround. It was a very, uh, very hard sequence to do. Uh, but those guys came on and knocked it out of the park. And, and that was due to, you know, Addie digging in her heels and trying to find somebody to help out and, 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 you know, kind of scouring the globe to see who was available and, uh, you know, catching, catching the, those guys at the right time and, and, and bringing them on. So, um, it was Eddie. If you, if you have another sequence. Well, you know. I mean, that's a good one. It's, um, I was going to mention the Lancer attack at the, in, uh, nine, I think, um, and, um, yeah. sort of the same reason, uh, the, I mean, COVID and the explosion of streaming content has sort of like revolutionized the global capacity of, in visual effects. Um, artists change companies all the time, but there's just like, there's like a hundred times more visual effects shots than there are artists in the world. And so mm -hmm. they're all, every show is just jockeying constantly. Like, can I have a little capacity? Can I have a little capacity? Um, and quite a lot of that work is relationships so that you know when somebody has 5% capacity and you can like dive in there. But the Lancer attack at the end of 109 was a big action sequence that had um, more shots than we originally planned for. So our need grew and that caused us to, with that scene has like 100 or 150 shots and we had at least four vendors working on it. And most of them, most of the shots had two, three or four vendors working on each shot. So we would get like roto and paint from one company, pass it to another company, get the ship put into it, pass it to another company who would blow something up and pass it to another company who would put the vault in it, which is logistically and creatively very challenging to navigate and it was one of it was maybe the last scene that delivered so it was like every day we were like 25 shots from India they got to go to London and then they got to go to Montreal and Chris has got to look at them and don't comment on this but do talk like is the ship blowing up okay because we got to blow it up in six more shots and <laughs> just I don't know and you season two and was scouting I think at the time so sorry, sorry Addie I think what you were saying was I was I was on season two uh a, a scouting uh, getting, you know, getting ready for prep while we were doing all of that. And then um, it, it just kind of, you know, you know, on top of all of the other logistical issues, that was, that, that was another uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, wrench thrown into the mix. So. Um, yeah. But okay. I think to, just to go back to the original question, both of those scenes were shot um, very close to their due date. So they were shot very quickly, cut very quickly, turned over to visual effects vendors very quickly. We had trouble finding capacity. So we were beg borrowing and stealing and knocking on doors and begging people to come play with us on these scenes. And I think both the scenes turned out really lovely. So it's everybody pulled together, the vendors pulled together, Chris uh, scouting locations and Mike Enriquez, who's not with us today, but he was an editorial. They tag team supervision and under circumstances that should have made those scenes really impossible. I think they came out, they came out quite impressively. How do you, cause you mentioned, you know, jumping around with the different vendors, how do you ensure consistency across all the, the vendors in terms of the look? Um, well, we, I, I think one thing that really helped us out is the fact that we didn't do a lot of blue screen shooting or blue stage shooting. We had photography that was, you know, consistent. So we could, you know, you know, we, our show is, is as photo real as we can possibly make it. So, you know, if we send them a plate or we send them a sequence, we say, here's, um, here's, here's the plate, uh, put, put the, uh, you know, put the vault into the plate or put the lancers into the plate and, and make it look as photo real as possible using the HDRs and all the data that we had provided to them. Um, 
and then it's it's just about uh you know especially if you know a vendor ha uses a different render engine or something like that you know just making sure that um you know that they're matching assets or matching their uh their lighting and matching the rendering uh across the across the shot um and that boils down to mike uh addy and myself looking at the shots and going okay do they match are they good enough do do we need to get you know could we, in in, uh, in di or in grading we would take the uh you know we'd get uh, mats which are, are basically alpha channels that we can then use to um grade uh, the CG separately in case something just isn't quite working or, or, or something needs, needs to be touched up, uh, in terms of black levels or things, something like that. Um, but, but, uh, you know, for the most part, um, you know, uh, PBR renders are, 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 are kind of, um, uh, they're, they're almost at a standard or a standardized level where people, uh, or where, you know, when they do the renders, they, they all kind of match. So it's never, it's never wildly different. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, but, uh, you know, if it, it just depends like things like motion blur or, or, uh, black levels are usually the biggest issues that we run into when, when dealing with, uh, different vendors. But, um, but usually, you know, you, you share assets as well. Like you would have like a camera, for instance, if, 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 um, you would get one company to track the camera and that camera would be given to the other vendor. Um, yeah. and they, they would use that camera because if you're rendering with a different camera, um, that can be an issue. Um, things like that. Like there's always a, there's always a logistical, uh, you know, uh, sharing procedure that has to take place in order for a shot to work. And usually, um, usually, you know, Mike, Mike would come up with that or, 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 um, Addy and the team would come up with uh, that solution and, and run forward with it. So, yeah, and I think to uh, just add on that a little bit, like he was saying with shared workflows, um, I mean, we definitely sort of had a philosophy of radical transparency. Um, we didn't, we were not circumspect about who was working on which scenes, which episodes, which assets. Um, we, every vendor kind of knew what other companies were working on which scenes. So, they could work together that way. It, you know, we would have conference calls. We would sh have people talk through their workflows. We would share as soon as somebody got a look that everybody liked, we would pass it to all the other companies. So they would have it. We just didn't, uh, we took down all the walls. So <laughs> we were like, if everybody's under contract and everybody's secure, then everybody can see each other's work when they need to. And, um, and yeah, and then Chris was always in, in the final DI session and did the final dial in at that mm -hmm. point. Um, I don't think there was a lot of stuff that was wildly off base, but that final color correct, you know, I think it's like important to have visual effects in that final co color correct to just make sure everything gets unified properly. Now I have one last question for you guys. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or television show to watch? Patty, do you, uh, you um, want to go for that one? I wish I had like a really smart thing to say, but um you know, I grew up on like CWWB shows and I'm in the middle of rewatching the third season of Vampire Diaries on yeah. Netflix. It's a great one. It's like my my comfort viewing is just like watching mm. watching seven seasons of something that I've already seen in the background of the day, you know. <laughs> I'm not proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> How about yourself, Chris? Uh, my my guilty pleasure is uh, I, I I go back and rewatch X-Files every every year so have you, have you decided to keep up with the new series or that uh, they launched? i i haven't really kept up with it um i think i'm one season off of that but i just yeah. like looking at all the uh you know all of the old storytelling and all of the old uh you know the stuff i grew up with uh becoming obsolete and and then getting a good laugh at it you know yeah. later on so um like formative anyways that's for both of us <laughs> uh, yeah exactly it's it's like it's, it's like a, an old friend you go visit every once in a while yeah. yeah yeah well thank you so much for letting me interview you today thank you no thank you very much for having us and uh yeah hopefully talk to you again yeah that's it for this week everyone make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com i'm gordon burkell thanks for watching Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. 
And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.